Anyway, uh, okay, I need to uh, mention um, uh, the last couple of days that uh, I've gone to use the library on Evans and Pike, and normally I have a friend of mine that I'm riding with in his car when I go there, but he hasn't been around lately, so I've been getting familiar with the 72 route. And um, the driver and I <coughs> are talking as we were uh, coming back to the Nolensville Road, uh, and both of us agreed that uh, it would be good if uh, instead of making the changes uh, in, in the, any kind of reductions in that way, uh, that would be good instead, uh, when you come up to Nolensville Road from Edmondson, uh, where the bus makes a left and goes down by Walmart and then makes a right on the, uh, I forget the name of the street, right behind Walmart, uh, but instead uh, coming up uh, Edmondson Pike to Nolensville Road and then continuing straight on uh, Wallace and going straight uh, Wallace all the way to Linbar, come back around to Harding Place, back up Harding Place to John Quill, down John Quill to Paragon Mills, and then out to Nolensville Road back to the stop, whereas you would pick up many more riders that way uh, because there are certain points on Wallace where the 52B does not cover and would give riders, uh, you know, people up that way a better chance to be able to catch a bus. And then in most of the area, would also give riders uh, a second route uh, to work with. <coughs> so if they can't make uh, the 52B, they can always catch the 72 and get to Walmart and catch the A, a or B at that point, uh, heading downtown if that's where they're going. Um, and it would be much more convenient uh, for people. And like I said, you, uh, you would pick up more riders. Uh, and I'm sure you'd probably pick up uh, quite a few riders that way. Um, also, uh, still, even though I know that uh, you know, the budget cuts and everything, but we still need longer bus hours because there are still a lot of riders out there that need the buses later at night. And uh, again, our customer care hours to match. And... Um, Oh, and one more thing, uh, airport, uh, since I'm going on a trip on August 2nd, it's just kind of um, made me think that there's only one bus stop out there. Can we get two or three more? That would make it a little easier for uh, people who are going to catch a flight uh, to get to some of the different stops, you know, to get closer to the airlines that they need to get to. Okay, that's it. Thank you. See, Hannah, I'm listening to you. Mm -hmm. It really works. Really works. Yeah. <laughs> Angelique Johnson. Good afternoon, Ms. Johnson. Good afternoon. Um, mm -hmm. I guess I want to start off by thanking you all. Y'all did a great job with listening to some of our concerns with the cuts and for the routes and things. So I really appreciate, you know, the things that we adjusted and got squared away for the riders to get to and from where they need to go. Um, my first concern is the same thing John said about the announcement of stops. I feel like it's unacceptable and that we need to enforce it because I feel like it don't cost any money just to get on there and tell them to, you know, enforce for them to announce the stops because <clears throat> I have got off the bus at the wrong stop and um, like a stop before my stop and when I got off the bus and I thought it was the right stop but it wasn't, I had to end up crossing the street and I couldn't see it across the street so I was out there for quite a bit of time trying to figure out how to cross the Across the street, but if I would have got off at the right stop, I wouldn't have to cross the street, and I would have been right on time for my meeting. So I just wanted to address that because I know that it don't really cost a lot of money, and it's just to just get on there and just enforce them to do it. Um, also, I want to talk about um, just a question to you guys about like um, I know we were shortfall this year with money. But, like, how does that look for, like, crosswalks and also benches and shelters? Because um, I know we was talking about it a little bit, and I don't know how it looks now since we kind of low on funds, but I'm um, trying to see, like, what can we do about that? And yeah, I think that's about it. So thank you all. Thank, thank you for coming today. Person, may I ask, I'd like to ask a 
a question. Okay. When you get on the bus, mm -hmm. do you tell the driver that you want to be let off at a certain spot and please call that spot when you get there? Um, sometimes it depends on like exactly where I'm at. Like if I'm familiar with it, then no, I don't do it. But like if I I'm somewhere that I don't know where I'm at, I make yeah. sure I do that because I really, really don't want to get off. But like, um, so that time I was on the bus that I ride daily, which is the 22 part on. It's like right there where my house is. So, um, no, some majority of the times that the machine works and it tells us like you know we're stop we at and stuff like that. The majority of the times they don't work. So I guess it's just to enforce them and say like make sure it's on at all times and it's running at all times because some people can't see to get on and off the bus. You know like sure, sure. Yeah. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thanks again for coming. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. Good afternoon. Okay. First of all, I'm going to piggyback off of what Angelique was saying about the calling stops. Now, Mr. Cersei, you asked her if she told them. It doesn't matter. They are supposed to call the stops at all times, according to the Americans with Disabilities Act. Gotcha. So you shouldn't have to tell them anyway. And even so, there have been times when I've asked a bus driver, will you please let me off at such and such? And I'll get, well, ring the bell. And I'm like, okay, I have to explain why, you know, I'm legally blind. I may not be able to see that stop in time to ring the bell. But, or I, you know, or a driver say, oh, I might forget. Remind me when we're, well, we shouldn't have to do that. Okay. You should automatically call all stops and in time for the person to ring the bell because those the automated things sometimes they'll they'll announce the stop and the bus driver's almost on the stop already and then I hit the bell and missed the stop because yeah. the announcer didn't announce it far enough in advance so okay um, one quick thing about the, the elevator floor um, for the, the elevator out there, there's some kind, it kind of buckles up, and my foot has gotten caught on it a couple times, almost tripped. So if there's any way they can fix that and flatten it, that would be nice. Um, stops and the Americans with Disabilities Act. I have a friend who rides to church, and she gets off at Haywood Lane. However, the stop there at Haywood Lane, when she gets off, she's afraid she's going to go flying because there's an incline. So up until about a month ago, drivers have been accommodating to let her off a little past that stop where the ground is flatter. We just had a driver, it was about a month ago, I haven't been on the bus because um, I was out of town, but um, that driver says, oh, I can't do that. And she's like, well, you know, and she stated her case, and he kind of gave her flack about it. One minute. They should, yeah, okay, they should be more accommodating, especially if a stop is not ADA accessible and way too many of them are not ADA accessible. Maybe once again bring up that Dollar General stop. So that's what I have to say, and thank you for listening. Thank you, Ms. Hanson. Mr. Thomas. <coughs> Mr. Thomas, I think I saw you on the news or a paper or something recently. I'm not shy on TV. <laughs> <laughs> I've been on TV too. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Say two more weeks to my birthday. I'll be 51. Yay. Happy birthday. And one new knee brace was costing $2,700, but, you know, Take care of pay for how to get the x-rays from. Um, just want to let you know there's a couple of, couple of bus drivers that I've gotten really good, be really good friends with, and they're really cool. One's the, uh, I catch the users around 7 o'clock in the morning or 9 o'clock in the morning heading to downtown for my stop on Harding Place. And the other, I pick him up on Monday nights and Tuesday nights down here. He leaves at 8.15. Pretty cool guys. They do a great job. Have no issues with them. But um, I was talking to the one, I was coming down to town this morning about the um, the fit to be that came down Harding Place instead of going around Wallace Road, and he mentioned to me that this is on uh, 722 when it happened. He mentioned to me that they may have had it on detour, which you know when you're out there getting off the bus, walk across the street, and you see bus do something that you know it's not supposed to do, you'll know it's on detour or not. So I already let little things like that down. May find about a little later, but still, it's good to know that it was on detour because of car fire or something on the Wallace Road area. And then today at um, 
1120, I stand in front of the limelight or there on the Woodland Street where the uh, Thai food kit restaurant used to be at. At the Shelby Street, at the um, the bus stop there, sitting on the bench, when the number four Shelby Street buses came on by, they didn't even stop picking me up. Mm-hmm. So, again, these drivers need to be more attentive to people at the bus stops. They may be sitting down, they may be getting ready to get the card out, saying, get ready to stand up, but still, the passenger at a bus stop, stop and ask. Mm-hmm. Makes it easier on everybody else. But I, I, like, I like the... Uh, the way they got to stop there at Walmart now. At least you're not walk across Mill Street, you walk across that stoplight. Great. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Thomas. Bye. Mr. Thomas, you have I don't have any more public comments slips. Does anyone else have a public comment they wish to make? Does anybody else have a public comment they like? Last call. Anybody else have a public comment they'd like to make? If not, then that closes the public comment portion of our agenda. Thank you very much. Now that it is past 2.30, we can move on to... Uh, yeah. <laughs> um, the uh, while we have on here approval of June 27, yes. 2019 minutes, I will be quite candid. I saw some changes that needed to be made, and I just didn't get them to Monica in time. So... If it pleases you all, if we could defer the approval of the minutes until I can get her the changes that I saw. And I apologize for not getting that done. So, did we defer the minutes? Second. All those in favor? Yes. Right. Thank you very much. So we'll pick those up in August. I appreciate it. Uh, Mr. Searcy. Are we ready? Yes. For the we're function ready. at the junction. <laughs> <laughs> all right. We have one action item. We have a recommendation from staff uh, from operations and finance to uh, enter a new enter a new enter into a new contract with RTA so that they can continue to link the Music City Star with other bus services uh, and are willing to compensate us for the continuation of that process to uh, to the amount not to exceed $105,100 annually. Uh, this contract is to run from not hither and yon, but for one year beginning uh, September 30. Yes. September 30 through June 30. That's not actually a, a year. Yeah, nine months. Thank you. All right. Um, so that recommendation uh, is now being made. Would that be in the recommendation of the committee? It does not require a second. Any discussion? All those in favor say aye. 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 I will say this wasn't for discussion, but I, I think it's 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 really a good example of our community working together in this climate that we're in right now. So um, it's, it's admirable that we're in this space. So. Good job. Must be that RTO leadership. <laughs> I thought it was his, I thought it was his committee partner. <laughs> and, and that the committee itself had the foresight to be able to approve this incredible opportunity for we go. Just as Especially a dis- the co chair. Just as a disclaimer, the RTA board hasn't <laughs> yeah. acted on it yet, but we don't anticipate any problems. <laughs> <laughs> well, that'd be disappointing. Yeah, I'm sure. Is there anything? Trust me, I'm deferring. <laughs> anything further for. Um, Nothing further from the vaunted uh, Operations and Finance Committee. Well, thank you very much. Uh, Mr. Farner, I believe you're going to give the report today of the new initiatives of Community Engagement Committee. So, so, uh, so moved. <laughs> 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 That's the, committee report. That's the committee report. Well done. 
Well done. Nice of you to defer to Ben Absolutely. We're developing his leadership skills. <laughs> It's all about board development, isn't it? It's yes. such a critical part of the work that we do, yes. isn't it? Yes. Um, yes, indeed. Chair's report, I work with the best board members ever, right? So uh, thank you all. Last month we had just marathon. We had a marathon board meeting, but I thought that as a board we did a great job. But even before that, the work that had to be done the months and months before we even uh, arrived at the board meeting and I just want to congratulate each of you and thank each of you for your time, your effort, your thoughtfulness and, and your work that you put into doing the work that we get the grand opportunity to do for our community and for Nashville. So thank you all and kudos to the good work that you want to do. So I just and want to you. say thank you. And chair. <laughs> thank and you. And so I really appreciate it. Again, I just want to echo this uh, uh, action item that we just voted on. Again, is the community coming together to support our ridership and support our community in meaningful ways. And that should not go without being said. Again, to our public, public comments, they mean something. They mean a lot. They help guide the work that is done by We Go Transit. And we do appreciate your comments, and they matter. Um, and to that... Uh, one last thing, India, I mean, we can't say enough about thanking you for the work that you've done here. And to sort of see you go out into this great leadership role is just uh, an incredible testament to your hard work and to all the great things that you've done here and you will continue to do. So don't forget about us. Thank you. Okay. And congratulations. Thank you. And that concludes uh, my report, and I'll turn it over to you, Steve. Thank you, Madam Chair and members. Um, just a few things. I'll highlight, as uh, Mr. Searcy did in the Operations and Finance Committee, that page 13 and 14 of the committee packet uh, identify some of our upcoming procurements. So we certainly would appreciate the board both circulating information to vendors that you might know in those areas, uh, but also letting us know who we might reach out to. And I'll, and I'll say that every month. Uh, you may have seen some media coverage in the last couple of days with respect to a federal grant application we submitted to advance the uh, Clarksville Pike Transit Center. Very proud of our staff for putting a Build Act grant together. I think it's a super strong application. I'm happy to forward. There's a lot of really, it's there's some technical, but there's a lot of good overview information. So happy to uh, forward that to any members who are interested. Uh, but I would also add that the BUILD Act is one of the most competitive federal programs in the country. They generally get about $50 in requests for every dollar they have to give away. So if we are not successful, frankly, it's not a reflection on the project. And uh, I think the work that's been done will set us up to pursue other funding opportunities down the road. So I'm really appreciative of the staff effort in that regard. Um, Who would the staff lead on that Wow, I'm going to leave somebody out. Julie, Felix, Hannah, Justin. We had support from CDM Smith on the consultant side. Rita's group was involved. Who am I leaving out of that? Julie's not here. Billy Higgins. Uh, how can I forget Billy? Uh, we don't submit grants without Billy Higgins. She's the only one who has the keys to the <laughs> keys to the Got car it. Got it. in that regard. Um, so, you know, just pretty a large amount of coordination. Uh, Katie and Dan Freudberg, a lot of what we looked at was... Did they have uh, their baby? Yes, they did. <laughs> I'm sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt you. <laughs> <laughs> I, 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 I you know, they, they were supposed to send me an email if they had their baby on. Uh, eight pounds, six, <laughs> two ounces. Baby boy, everybody's baby boy. doing well. Sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt just So that was a very worthwhile interrupt, <laughs> especially since you know my personality. Yeah, I neglected to put that in my, my comments. That's okay. So That's okay. Uh, you, you were going to get there. You didn't have to tell I would have gotten there by next month. <laughs> <laughs> um, a lot of our focus, obviously, uh, since the last boarding, board meeting has been on preparing for the service changes and the fare increase. Uh, marketing and communications in particular has been active and our focus right now is prepping for the fare increase uh, which will go into effect on August 2nd 
and pretty much instantly after that uh, transition takes place, we will move over to putting out the service changes. You want to be careful doing the service change stuff too early because people get confused about what current service is versus what's coming up. So there are a number of activities that will be going on uh, with respect to those changes. Item number 10 on the board agenda, I, I was very optimistic and aggressive in uh, saying, hey, we're going to be able to tour the new Nestor facility. The work is complete. Contractors are done, but uh, all of the staff over there want to show it in its best light. And its best light right now has a lot of cardboard boxes and moving stuff lying around. So I hope you will carve some time out for after the August MTA board meeting and we'll take a ride over uh, and see that. We did a tour over there probably about a year and a half ago. Uh, and obviously there's still a lot of areas of that building that need work, but I think as you go through our dispatch areas, our crew rooms, um, some of the maintenance support areas, the office space, uh, you'll admit that it's about a 500% improvement over what was there. Um, I attended last week, I attended the board planning workshop for the Tennessee Public Transportation Association up in Clarksville. I chair TIPTA's legislative committee, and a lot, of, a lot of our focus in the upcoming year will be trying to get transit better integrated into TDOT's long-term planning and design process so that things like um, well-integrated park and rides and transit priority measures can be incorporated up front into design projects. We have a very good relationship overall with the multimodal division in the department. They do a tremendous job. We just need to try to get mass transit more into that mainstream of thinking, particularly as we have a number of um, road improvement projects uh, over the next few years. I also was elected as secretary treasurer for TIPTA, which in and of itself doesn't mean much, but fortunately or unfortunately kind of puts you in the rotation to, to move up that line. Um, we have, uh, I want to thank several of our public commenters today because in addition to the valuable remarks they make here, we invited them to participate in our Better Bus Advisory Committee and we had a number of them out. John was there, Darius was there, who am I leaving out? Uh, Sheila, were you there this week? I must, must have missed you. What was that? At our Better Bus Advisory Group. Um, but in any case, yes, you're on that group, and um, a lot of good discussion, a lot of good input, as well as a number of other community organizations. So that process is moving forward. It, in accordance with um, FTA regulations, our staff is in the process of updating our Title VI program. Title VI is intended to ensure non-discrimination in the delivery of our services, programs, and projects. So we'll be taking the program update out for public comment in August, and we'll bring it back to the board for review and approval in September. Some RTA items, uh, unfortunately, and a recurring um, news item. We lost another park and ride lot, this time in Rutherford County, uh, where we, we board about 14 people, so it's not a huge lot but it does contribute to kind of a downturn cycle in ridership on those services. So one of our key objectives, and again, it ties into what we're talking to TDOT about, is how do we get better permanent purpose-built park and ride lots, which there's a lot of, um, a lot of P's in that. Um, we're in the process of turning over new commuter coaches to Gray Line for them to operate in RTA service. As I mentioned last month, they will be painted in the WeGo public transit uh, livery, so you will probably see them tooling around not only in Nashville, they'll obviously be coming into this building, but kind of all over the 10 county region uh, as they're on those commuter runs. We also received our final report from the state comptroller's office relative to the RTA sunset legislation. The only significant item was just a formalizing of easy ride contracts with employer sponsors. Uh, we seem to have comptroller's audits at the RTA about as often as we have mayoral elections in Nashville. Um, so we're kind of hoping, like this mayoral election, we're kind of hoping with our legislative review to stretch that out a little bit. But um, Sumner County Mayor Anthony Holt and I will be appearing, uh, Anthony chairs the RTA's audit committee, will be appearing before the um, State Government Operations Joint Committee on Oversight uh, in August to update them on that. Um, also relative to regional issues, um, Clarksville is also looking for a transit director. 
So all sorts of all sorts of upheaval uh, in transit leadership roles. And I am participating. Uh, Mayor Pitts up there asked me to participate in the search committee. So uh, I'll be working on that. So if anybody knows or is interested in uh, running Clarksville Transit. <laughs> <laughs> I'm in my leadership skills. <laughs> <laughs> you just chaired the committee so well. But just so you're aware, I signed a non-disclosure. So if you're interested, call Clarksville City HR. Don't talk to me. <laughs> <laughs> uh, <laughs> you know, you, you have more experience than most of this. <laughs> and then um, finally, I know everybody, uh, Walter in the um, Operations and Finance Committee and Gail in her remarks, uh, thanked and acknowledged and wished luck to India. Um, certainly, I, I absolutely echo and join that. Thank you so much for everything you've done. Um, I think you're crazy for taking that job. But, uh, <laughs> oh, how sweet was that? <laughs> Put it to you, you know, this way. <laughs> Put it to you this way. You will have no shortage of uh, activities <laughs> to uh, to keep you busy, and and I know a lot of people to give you advice. Um, so, but you're always welcome to come back. And as I said to you, you know, you all know this is um, India's first transit CEO job. So I did offer it to her when you wake up in a cold sweat in the middle of the night. Feel free to call me because I'm probably awake in a cold sweat myself. <laughs> Have mercy. Um, with that, Madam Chair, that concludes my report, unless well, there are any questions. Great report. Thank you very much. I will turn it over to you, Mark. Thank you very Thank much. You. So we have two items today, and one is uh, just to review our ethics policies, and second, the uh, to elect officers of the board. Uh, just to give a little bit of a history lesson about this this review of the ethics policy, I always think of Marion Ott when this comes up uh, uh, because Marion wanted to make sure every year that the board was made aware of these policies. Most of these policies are just really common sense, but it is really helpful and it's a good thing that she implemented to say, let's just take a few minutes and let's just look at this and make sure we know what policies we have in place. Uh, and so that's what this review is about. Now, our policies intersect with the FDA procurement policies, too. So what you have here, I have graciously not put before you all the FDA <laughs> procurement <laughs> policies. But if there's something that's a little different here, I'll point it out. The policy that I have put before you is a policy that was implemented 12 years ago by the board. At that time, and you'll see here just as a little bit of an introduction at the beginning, the state legislature mandated that every municipality have a, an ethics policy. And in doing that, they helped out the municipalities. They gave a model act. The board passed this model act then prior to the deadline as to when the state required you to have an ethics policy. Metro also has an ethics policy. And as part of metropolitan government, as part of that policy, there was some unclear information as to whether or not MTA was exempted or not. We, as a, as a legal team, looked at that and thought that MTA was exempted. Metro Legal knows that. There's no issue there, just to let you know. This policy is simple, and it's what the state law requires municipalities to have. So that's what we have at this point. The thing that I think that's really interesting for you all to know is that there's always questions about gifts, you know, what you should do about gifts. I'm going to focus on that. And what really is a conflict of interest? So under this policy, if you have a personal interest in a matter, that might be a conflict. And you'll see at the bottom, it's defined, and it's as I said, this is common sense, a financial ownership or employment interest in whatever the subject of your vote is going to be. That's what you have to think about. And as you go to the next page, you'll see that also you have to consider your family members. So there is the definition of family members, and the municipal, this, this law, I mean, your ethics code, is a little bit more straightforward as to what an immediate family member is. It sets out more than the FTA guidelines say, but it's still, I think it's helpful so that you know what is defined as an, uh, 
immediate family members. So it is step parents, it is step children. It's not just biological or children. There's also an emphasis on both the FTA policy and on in this policy about negotiating possible employment. <laughs> and you know, so you can have a whole lot of employees here, obviously, and with DTO or and they could be in the midst of negotiating something with a particular contractor, employment. So the same thing, this policy applies to the board and employees. So this talks about if you are negotiating with an employer or thinking about or having some kind of conversation, you need to pull out. You have personal interests. And the FTA guidelines really set forth how to disclose, where to go, what to do, and how to protect yourself. You all won't have those issues because the employees, you're not going to be employed by a particular vendor. But you might if there's one that's coming before you to approve on procurement because the procurement's 300000 or more is within your authority. So under these policies, the big thing that you have to do if you have a personal interest is you disclose. And so sometimes you see in a board meeting, you say, I have a conflict of interest and I'm going to recuse myself. Well, you're required to say what that conflict is. So it's not just, well, I have a conflict. You disclose to everybody out there what it is so that everybody understands. Now, under this policy, you still may vote. But under FTA policy, I don't think you should. Okay, and I don't think most of you all would anyway. So if you have a conflict, you need to announce it. You need to say why, and then I recommend you recuse yourself from that vote. And once again, I think that just seems like common sense. Um, so let's talk about gifts a little bit. Our policies provide that you should not accept a gift if it would look like, okay, look like, essentially, someone was attempting to influence you. FTA says don't accept a gift if it is someone who is a vendor. So I'm going to give you a really good example. I'm a vendor because I'm hired as your lawyer. I go through a procurement process. So if I want to give you something under this policy, <laughs> you know, if I'm not really influencing you, you would probably be okay. But under FTA policy, I'm telling you, don't take a gift from me. You see what I'm saying? So vendors could be not just contractors or, you know what I'm saying, it could be professionals. It could be engineers. It could be our design teams. And there are a lot, there are a lot of vendors who come through MTA. Some of them you might not know. So if you don't know a person's a vendor, don't worry about that. <laughs> Obviously, they're not going to be influencing you because you don't know they're a vendor. So I'm not saying like, oh, be in a you know complete. Uh, but you know I'm a vendor, and you know I mean you know some of the vendors. They come now up I know before why you. She's never given me a gift before. Right. <laughs> <laughs> well, it also it also applies like if you want someone to sit at your table, so you come in and you know, you know, and you know you want to, you know, we work together, and so I, I get a table, and when you come and to the luncheon or something like that. You have to kind of be kind of careful about that. But once again, if you don't know the person's, you know, the entity's a contractor and doesn't, you know, you're, you're fine. Don't don't worry about that, all right? It's uh, the obvious kinds of things that you would think about. Um, now, uh, you obviously can't ask people at MTA to do something for you, like um, a contractor to come fix your door or your <laughs> do do kinds of improvements in your home, and that's what you see of use of MTA national time and facilities. So anything that you have personal, that's your your own personal thing, you can't ask somebody from MTA to do that for you. Once again, just really obvious kinds of things, and you. Uh, this doesn't apply to you, but with employees, they can't accept outside employees. That inhibits their performance from someone in a vendor like that. So, under the uh, state law, you have to name an ethics officer under this policy, and that ethics officer is me. And so, if you have, if there is a, uh, whether it's an employee or uh, you as a board member, there is a complaint, then that would come to me. And I can either investigate or I can recuse myself 
uh, because I don't think that I'm the best person to do it or I would think maybe my relationship with you all is not proper and then I would figure out a person who would do and investigate that. There are certain penalties uh, if you have violated your ethics rules. Um, there goes from censure to some kind of disciplinary action. Once again, you find this more with employees that you would than you would with board members. That that's why that's in there. So, does anybody have any general questions about what I think are good common sense ethic policies that are simple that don't go on for pages and pages except for FTA? But I would say that um, that I think these policies do a good job. You know, I looked at them again today at the FTA conflict of interest rules and then read this again. And I think this policy really does a good job of telling you what you can and cannot do. Obviously, if you ever have any questions from time to time, I get questions from you all. I'm happy to take them. You know, you have a concern about something, call me and I will be helpful. Hope can be helpful. Try to answer it. So. Anything? Don't have to, uh, adopt them. No, they're in place. This is just a review. Anybody else? Thank you. I think this is very helpful. Oh, you're nice to say that. I do too. The well, Marionaut helpful annual review. Well, it reminds all of us in the room as well. It protects our relationships. It's now not angry with you for not giving me a birthday. <laughs> <laughs> I thought that would probably be the best example to explain really what those what those policies mean. So the next item that we have that I am handling today on the agenda uh, is the election of officers, the annual election. As you know, Gail Williams is our chair. Janet Miller is the vice chair. I'm going to open the floor for nominations, and whoever has a nomination may do. Those are the two positions we have open. I'm the secretary, so we have president and vice chair. Walter. You're conducting this election. I am. Yes. And I would like to uh, move that the uh, current officers remain in place. Uh, and if that will be seconded by someone, so I'll second. we can uh, move on. And uh, it looks like we had two seconds of non-officers, <laughs> so I assume the officers are willing to serve again another year. Yes? Yes. All right. Yes. Thank you. <laughs> so all in favor of our current officers remaining in place for another year, say aye. aye. All opposed, say no. The ayes have it, and I think you all need a round of applause for <laughs> Right. Okay, then. Well, it's my honor to serve. Thank you. Yeah, we pay you, we pay you so well. I know you do because we have these ethics things to say you can't. Speaking of that ethics thing, I think, I think if I understood right, you, you couldn't buy Hannah a birthday present, but she could buy you a birthday present. <laughs> <laughs> That's how it works. That's true. That is true. Yeah, I thought I understood correctly. Thanks for he, as a leader, he would be a good critical thinker, wouldn't he? <laughs> and by the way, you're welcome. Rumors that Margaret asked me to put this on the agenda because people were complaining they weren't getting gifts from her are totally blown out of proportion. Well, does anybody else have anything for the good of the order today? You missed her. You did. You did. Sorry. Can I speak? Okay. <laughs> but I'm cutting you to two and a half minutes. You only got two and a half minutes. Only because I know who you are. <laughs> You've been out. I feel a little half a loop today, so I'm just. <laughs> Last time I came to one of these monthly meetings, I walked in on the presentation of proposed changes to fares, routes, and other things in order to balance the MTA budget. Deja vu. It was 2008 all over again. I've never taken a course in business or economics, yet even I could clearly foresee that certain company actions after 2010 were not cost effective. The very rebranding to Wego, very nice, but how much cost was involved? Setting up routes 60 and 61 as free rides, again, nice, but patently far from cost effective. 
And the worst action was purchasing buses in which the majority of the seats face inward rather than forward. A short glance tells anybody that three inward-facing seats take up as much room as four forward-facing, therefore smaller rider capacity. Uh, moving on to current concerns, it appears that neither bus drivers nor MTA staff have a clue what route changes, deletions will occur or when. They only know that fares go up on the first. So, for instance, I cannot learn how much longer I can ride routes 2 or 20 or when 20's itinerary gets combined with that of route 4. And how will the times be changed in this transition? There's a major problem with bus stop spacing on 12th Avenue South. Between South Street and Edge Hill Avenue on the outbound side, that is the west, there are three stops, four if one counts the stop as the outbound bus reaches South Street. On the inbound side, there is one stop only, two if one counts the stop at, as the inbound bus reaches Edge Hill. Since I frequently am wanting to travel in from 12th and Edge Hill, this lack of inbound stops has often put me at a serious disadvantage, which it did today. It makes no sense to have several more bus stops on one side of the street than the other when buses are traveling both directions. <coughs> Finally, some bus drivers who have to make the detours uh, are taking varying routes, specifically buses departing the upper level, that'd be 1, 2, 3, 5, 7, 8, 10, and 17, mostly go right on 5th, right on Gay, and round the block to proceed on Charlotte. Most 17 drivers do likewise, but a few stay on 5th to left on James Robertson, and then they go willy-nilly until they get back to, at some point to the original route. That's all I have today. Thank you. Well, thank you. For purposes of the record, could you state your name, please? Oh, I'm Glenn Allen Graham. Thank you, Mr. Graham. Appreciate it. Anybody else? There's nothing further. We are adjourned. Thank you. Thank you.